Thank you, thank you. So I'll uh, I'll do a little spiel about what's going on with the club. Uh, we are online this year, which is unfortunate, but also opens up some opportunities like for us to have cool speakers like Steve Keen who are coming in from very far away and I'll let him talk about that. Um, next week, we've got some exciting stuff on Wednesday at lunch at noon. Our very own Larry Wigger is going to do a presentation on Supply Chains 101, part of our 101 series where we cover sort of intro elements of basic topics that people are interested in. Um, we'll have a few more of those as the year goes on, so keep an eye out. And then next Friday, so a week from today at 1 p.m., we are gonna have Katharina Pistor, who is author of a book called The Code of Capital, also author of a great paper called The Legal Theory of Finance. That's gonna be a good presentation. So I'm excited about that one. Um, and I think the week after we've got Robinson doing a brown bag. So that should be good too. Is that right, Robinson? I think so. Um, so yeah, please join us. Uh, it's pretty cool that we can have speakers from far and wide. So we're making the most of it. We're doing our best. No free lunches this semester, but you know, we'll still have some good presentations. Um, Steve, uh, I guess, well, what should I tell them about you? I mean, you've I'll been at this you. forever. And, um, <laughs> That's about right. You're the author of a ton of books, including Debunking Economics, which is uh, an amazing reference book to keep on your shelf. Um, and your, your recent book was, um, Can We Avoid Another Financial Crisis, I believe. Mm -hmm. Yep. Um, mm -hmm. You've got the, the Minsky software that does sort of the um, continuous time system dynamics type modeling. Um, mm -hmm. uh, let's see, I haven't, um, I, I feel like last time I had a, had a beat on you, you were in London, but now you're in Bangkok? That's right. I mean, partly because uh, when, I, when I saw um, the coronavirus coming, I was actually lucky to have a number of uh, non-Orthodox um, people who are also medical specialists who warned me about this sudden virus in, in China and how contagious it was. And I was basically saying, I've got to choose, I'm not going to, I'm not going to die as a result of neoclassical fuck ups in so many words. Um, and, and then essentially ignoring this sort of stuff. I, I mean, you've seen this presentation and blaming it on neoclassical economists. Um, so I thought I'm getting, going to go to the safest place on the planet that I can actually get to, uh, the UK and, uh, Netherlands, where I was living at the time, as it happens, because my girlfriend was living in the Netherlands, so I, I bought a place there. Uh, they were ruled out by their performance, and it's an incredibly good decision to get out of there. Uh, the choices left for Australia and Thailand, and we chose Thailand. And I don't know how many of you are aware of this, but Thailand has a population of roughly one sixth of America. Total case numbers, three and a half thousand. Okay. I'm not talking daily here. I'm talking absolute total over the last nine months. So uh, yeah, I chose well. <laughs> yeah, good on you. And I don't know if you've seen um, the headlines from the last 24 hours here in the US. Oh, I saw them before so you guys. There's one advantage of being in a different time zone. <laughs> <laughs> I knew what you were going to wake up to today. <laughs> so, well, thank you again for joining us and mm -hmm. take it away. Will do. And actually, we'll have a quick hello to Linwood there, who's uh, somebody I know knows some dynamics intimately. Good to see you again. It's been a long time. Good to see you, Steve. It's been a while. Yeah. Oh, you're happy you're like... Yeah. So you're still we're making trouble. Of... Oh, absolutely, mate. Yeah. Yeah. It's yeah. what else are there to do in this current exactly. world? Exactly. Exactly. <laughs> but do um, well, I'd like to look forward? Uh, let's have a bit of a chat about uh, Minsky too, by the way. Yeah. I, as yeah, you know, I've got yeah, it yeah. to the stage. I think it's actually something I'd like modern monetary theorists to start right. using. Uh, in anger rather than it's it's now a very workable way of modeling and illustrating our arguments right okay yeah, so i'll just actually go and uh get my share my screen here and actually what i'll do as well which i've forgotten to do for a moment and i got it i'm going to look there we go okay so i'm recording my my talk locally as well uh so let's get rolling and this is the presentation and let's actually get the screen out of the way here. Hang on a second. Uh, okay. Righto. So, uh, and I'll actually make this a bit smaller. Um, I wonder if I'm, I'm hoping I'm not going to see myself when I do that. Let's see if I can actually resize this. Hang on. Um, yeah, there's that option. And then I think I can resize. So just so I've got a few faces, I'll whack this down here somewhere so I don't... Um, lose 
uh, both audience participation and uh, what I'm trying to show on screen. So I'll move that around occasionally. Well, you'd, you'd all know that uh, uh, Nordhaus won the Nobel Prize. You know it's not a Nobel Prize, of course. I don't need to bother covering that particular uh, feature of the swindle by the uh, Bank, of Inc Bank of Sweden to try to defend neoclassical economics from 1969 on by naming uh, the prize they give and they pay and they choose the Nobel Prize, much to the chagrin of the Nobel family. But anyway, he won that prize in 2018. And that was actually a big mistake because he got 1.4 million for it, but it meant that he had to show his stuff in front of people who weren't economists or weren't neoclassical economists. And this particular chart, I think, in many ways, should have said it all for everybody, because there he's describing the outputs of a Ramsey growth model. I imagine you guys, have, uh, guys and girls have covered uh, the Ramsey growth model. You know how delusional that is, equilibrium through time, perfect foresight, single person for the entire economy, et cetera, et cetera. Nonetheless, it generates a growth path like this. And this line is what he says will happen if we do no abatement whatsoever. And that will lead to a six degree increase in temperature by 2150. But notice what he labels as the optimal path. Now that's the path where the costs of abating climate change plus the costs of climate change itself, according to his model, are the minimum possible. Uh, so that results in a temperature which is as optimal, and that will give us a planet that is four degrees warmer than the current at the pre-industrial level by 2150. And that's optimal, according to our dear genius, uh, uh, William Nordhaus. Now, when you talk about what scientists are talking about, but there's enormous literature of scientists saying what are the consequences of various levels of temperature increase. And the most striking is that uh, what we can have is what they call tipping cascades. So there are elements of the, of the planet which will qualitatively change with an increase in temperature. And the most obvious, and I'm going to be emphasising this, is the Arctic sea, and the winter sea ice, because that is effectively like having a mirror on the planet. Uh, covering uh, both the Arctic and, and the Antarctic, but the Arctic, of course, is far more vulnerable. Uh, the Arctic is like a mirror, uh, which reflects 90 to 95 per cent of the energy that falls on it from the sun. And it just goes, comes down, bounces straight back up again, doesn't get absorbed by the atmosphere in the same, in, in, by, it doesn't get absorbed by the land or the ocean. Um, uh, it, you know, some of it gets caught up in greenhouse gases on the way through, and that's the, the, the radiative forcing partially affected by it, but it would be far greater if that turns to black, effectively, very dark blue, uh, and absorbs, not, not reflects 95%, but absorbs 95% of the energy. And that can then cause Greenland to melt more rapidly, et cetera, et cetera. So one tipping point goes and causes another one to go. Now, um, at the same time, it's the same uh, year that uh, the economists, neoclassical economists, gave Nordhaus their, their prize, uh, this is a paper by, uh, I think about 18 scientists were involved in this particular one. And they said that at two degrees or above, we're likely to have these tipping points triggering one to another. So one which will uh, tricks below two will cause one that tricks above three, will cause one that tricks above four, et cetera, et cetera. And we could have a runaway, a runaway process. Uh, so they're saying we should really keep temperature rises below two degrees above pre-industrial. They were halfway there at the moment. Now, what Nordhaus says, on the other hand, is that six degree temperature increase would reverse GDP by 8.5% compared to what would happen if there was no climate change at all. And this is a quote from a paper of his, not from his uh, Nobel Prize speech now, but from the, uh, a paper published after it, pretty much encapsulating that speech, uh, in the American, in the, in the, uh, American Economic uh, Journal, Macroeconomics, I think it was, A AEJ. Um, so, 2.1% of GDP for three degrees warming and 8.5% for six, where the scientists are saying, if you get six degrees, you, might, you could potentially start writing off 95% uh, of the life forms on the planet, because that's the temperature level that caused one of the, some of the uh, major extinctions in our past. Uh, how come this is only going to damage GDP by 8.5%? Now, even when scientists use, use Nordhaus's own model, and modified its existence of tripping points, they found 1.5 degrees was the prediction of Nordhaus's model uh, as the level you should stop climate change. And we're two thirds of the way to that. The same within an immediate massive effort to control CO2, uh, which could lead to stabilization. That was in 2016, again, before Nordhaus got awarded the prize. So how on earth does he get these trivial numbers 
for climate change, when the scientists are terrified about the, an, an enormous change to the sustainability of life on the planet with the levels he's talking about. Well, he made them up. That's the best way to describe what he did. And, and I had no idea of this uh, before I started reading his papers after I started doing my own work on relationship between energy and GDP. And I decided now that I can actually make a positive contribution to this area, I'd better read what the neoclassicals have written. You know I'm a skeptic about them. So when I see numbers like that, I go and say, how did you get that number? Much to my amazement, nobody seems to have beaten me to that. Even there are a number of critics that I mentioned in a paper I published on this, <coughs> um, none of them actually went and said, where did these numbers come from? So what he called, when you look at how the little cabal that he's formed around himself through the refereeing process and the specialisation by this particular small band of neoclassicals on what they call climate change, uh, there were three main methods they used. They were the enumerative approach. Now, I won't, um, I'll, I'll give you the, 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 the prelude first of all, but the, the punchline is that they literally assume, and this is what they've written in text on paper, okay, all you have to do is read it. You don't need to be a mathematician to understand this stuff. He literally assumed that 87% of GDP will be unaffected by climate change because it happens indoors. Didn't actually use those words, but he meant it kept by carefully controlled environments, he meant anything with a roof or my, any included mining, so anything that happens underground. Uh, then the second approach is they call st the statistical method. And they, again, here another assumption. They assume that climate change to GDP uh, impact can be um, postulated from the relationship you can find between temperature and GDP today. Okay? And then a survey of experts. Well, when you see what he called an expert, how many people here regard Larry Summers as an expert on the climate? Okay. I don't. All right. Yeah, exactly. Uh, he was one of the 19 people that he was surveyed by, uh, by um, uh, Nordhaus in one of his surveys. Uh, and just adding up t 10 economists to, to two scientists, plus a few others, that's where the numbers got down. And then the thing I think is probably most shocking, and I would love to have somebody <clears throat> follow up on this, is, is what I've done as well. He distorted the scientific literature. When he read one of the papers on tipping points, uh, it, it, it is, it is a, I would give him 100 points for imagination and zero points for comprehension of reading that paper. Now, everybody thinks this high discount rate matters. That's what you see people talking about, you know, applying a high discount rate to damages. But really, that only plays a sort of mopping up role on top of all these assumptions. Because what he argues is that with a low interest rate, and that's why I've emphasised it here, the relatively small damages in the next two centuries. Okay? So he's saying nothing much is going to happen for two centuries. That's his prediction. In the two centuries, that includes a period of time where in 2018, he was saying there'd be a four degree increase in temperature. So he's saying it's no big deal. He's not denying that climate change is occurring in the sense that additional CO2 is leading to a rise in global temperature, but he's treating it as a simply the, the weather's getting warmer all across the planet and we can use relationships with weather today to predict what's going to happen when we increase the temperature level that, that, of the planet that high. Now, that's, so that's the most important point, is not the discount rate, that's a red herring in a sense. It's this argument that damages are relatively small. Now, you would hope that he would be isolated, but in fact he's cr created a little research engine uh, which, which has a, a bunch of people who publish papers and then get to referee papers written by other people that have the same opinion, and they let this crap go through. So here's the IPCC 2014, uh, and those data points, I'll just move the, the screen out of the way here, hang on a second, put it up there for a sec, okay. Um, these are the, the dot points relating a change in temperature right up to 5.5 degrees here to their predictions of the impact on welfare in terms of change of GDP income. Now notice for one degree, one of the papers they've got predicts virtually a 3% increase in GDP global compared to what it would have been. So that's well, that's what he's saying climate change is a good thing because it'll increase GDP. And you look at it, all of their damages bar one, and I've looked at that paper as well, I'll talk about that, I've actually included it in my talk, but I'll, I can talk about it if you like afterwards. The vast majority give trivial damages, okay, between one and 6% of GDP for a one to five degree, five and a half degree increase in temperature. Nothing like what the scientists are saying about climate change. So, the enumerative approach. This is, 
When I first read this, uh, there's, a, there's a particular paper by Richard Toll. I hate giving the asshole uh, any additional citations uh, because his work is so bad. And he is, <laughs> I mean, I've met some obnoxious people on Twitter. Uh, most of them are trolls. Uh, he has three of the five letters for the word troll in his name, and I think that's extremely appropriate with the way he behaves. And not towards, towards me, of course. I'm pretty aggressive, so I don't, I'm not amazed that people try to take me on. But the way he behaves towards climate scientists as well, disparaging uh, people. Um, he, he, he think he plays the role of the enforcer in this particular cabal. And anybody who starts showing signs of breaking away, he's the one who ridicules them, I would imagine. I haven't seen him in operation in his own little group. But anyway, here's his, here's his statement in a 2009 paper. Uh, in the enumerative approach, estimates the physical effects of climate change are obtained from what one, but from natural science papers, uh, and then we, we work out what those impacts are economically by bringing in prices. And that sounds reasonable. But then you say, well, what did they add up? Now, the very first paper in the series, which is typical of Toll's work, he didn't include this paper in his list of, the, of, of papers on the topic, uh, just a sheer oversight. Uh, he actually frequently had the wrong signs. You have a minus sign where the uh, author of the paper had a plus and vice versa. Uh, the, the paper itself is, is, itself is rubbish and has to be, had to be revised three times in publication. Uh, before it settled down, and even then Nordhaus was still finding errors in this paper himself. Nordhaus was finding errors. That's amazing. Uh, in this paper over a decade later. What did they do? And here's quoting Nordhaus in this very first paper in this so-called tradition, enumerative tradition. The most sensitive sectors are those uh, in which output depends in a significant way upon climatic variables. Substitute the word weather and you'll know what he's talking about. At the other extreme are activities such as cardiovascular surgery or microprocessor fabrication, which are undertaken in carefully controlled environments that will not be directly affected by climate change. Now, I'm willing to regard uh, an operating theatre or a microprocessor chair plant as a carefully controlled environment. But you know, how much percentage of GDP is that? Okay. Well, according to him, it's 87% of GDP are in sectors that are going to be negligibly affected by climate change. I mean, take a look at his table where he lists these things. These are the billion dollar values in 19, 1990, I think, or $1991. <coughs> Negligible effect, manufacturing and mining. Okay. Later on, they changed, they took mining out because they were, oh, gee, there's a lot of under a lot, a lot of open cut mines, aren't there? We better drop mining out of this list. But he literally included mining because it's un underground, but manufacturing you know, under a roof. Other transportation and communication, you're in a car, so you can turn the air conditioning on the car, you don't feel climate change. Finance, insurance, and the balance of real estate, so anything that's not actually literally on the coast, another 11% of GDP. Trade and other services, this is, um, manu this is uh, um, retail trade, wholesale trade, all the shopping we do, the works, um, and Walmart, blah, 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 27.9. Government, no effect on government, even includes the rest of the world in there, which I find hilarious. Total negligible effect, 87% of GDP, he's saying won't be affected. Now, when you leave it out, there ain't much left, okay? It's everything that happens indoors is going to be okay. And as, those are the three, if, if you're not indoors, uh, not underground, and not on the, uh, but you are on the coast, then okay, you might be in trouble, otherwise we can ignore climate change. That's their uh, about it. Now, you would hope that that would be, you know, as I said, they say, you're joking, let's have a realistic... No, 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 they all made the same assumption. So here's frequent, frequently asked question 10.3 from the IPCC report, where one of the authors, I'm surprised, is Richard Toll. Economic activities such as, notice, uh, agriculture, forestry, fishing and mining, so they've taken mining out of the unaffected into the affected because of open-cut mining, are exposed to the weather and thus vulnerable to climate change. Right? Weather equals climate change. Okay. Other activities take place in controlled environments. There's Nordhaus's own phraseology, not really exposed to climate change. Okay. What they're doing is they're equating the weather to the climate. They're equating the micro to the macro. And that's why the reason I said this is actually the neoclassical disease, which is at work here. And of course, they're ignoring disequilibrium effects because their model is an equilibrium system. They are comparing our equilibrium now, as they imagine it is, to the equilibrium we'll have in 2150. And, you know, little things like um, the carefully controlled environments burning up in a wildfire, well, that's a disequilibrium effect. We can ignore that. Yeah. Anybody here live in California? Okay. And this is why I thought it's time to quote Keynes here. 
uh, and actually explain what that in the long run we're all dead is about. And Keynes was actually criticising working in equilibrium terms. Okay? That's what gets lost because in the long run we're all dead is such a great line. Uh, but economists set themselves too easy to use as a task. If in tempestuous season they can only tell us that when the storm is long past, the ocean is flat again. Well, that's them ignoring the storm. Now, the survey of experts, let's take a look at that. That's the enumerative place. Now, the survey of experts, what do they do with that? Well, there were two surveys, one in 1994 and one in 2017. And in the 1994 paper, he surveyed 19 people. I'm calling people rather than experts for a good reason, because 10 of them were himself and nine other economists. And of that nine, he said eight, and this, of course, includes Larry Summers, come from disciplines outside environmental economics. Okay? They're not experts. They're people he knows. That's all it is. They're academics he knows. Uh, four other social scientists as well. And there were five people he classified as natural scientists and engineers. Now, when you take a look at it, there were three climate scientists in that group, but one of them refused to answer Nordhaus's questions. The, the main question he asked was, what do you think is going to happen to GDP if there's a three degree increase in temperature by 2090? Uh, if there's a six degree increase in temperature by, I think, 2150, uh, or if there's a six degrees by 2190, he gave them the three options, A, B, and C. And um, when you look at it, uh, the, the, most of the, the two, two of the, one of the climate scientists refused to answer the question. He thought it was so absurd. But the other two gave estimates that were within the median estimate. They're given a range on what's your median. Their median estimate was 20 to 30 times higher than the neoclassical economists gave. So this is what Larry Summers and friends, on average, thought would happen through, through a three degree increase in temperature, 0.4% fall in GDP, compared to what it would be in the complete absence of climate change. Those two scientists average out at 12%, okay, 30 times. When asked about the six degree temperature, and this is probably what just freaked out the other scientists, um, six degrees, they thought 3.5% fall in GDP. The, average, the median estimate of the other two scientists was half of GDP is gone. Now, you would think with that, um, that sort of thing, um, you'd, you'd be wanting to know why, why the diversions. But anyway, here is I'll give, one thing I'll give Ned, some Nordhaus a tiny amount of credit for is he, li he properly displayed what these respondents actually felt. There's quite a few interesting quotes in the overall paper. So one of them refused. This is one of the three scientists. And he wrote this wonderful line. I must tell you that I marvel at economists being willing to make quantitative estimates of the economic consequences of climate change were the only measures available at estimates of global surface uh, average increases in temperature. As one who has spent his career worrying about the vagaries of the dynamics of the atmosphere, I marvel that they can translate a single global number, an extremely poor surrogate for a description of climatic conditions, into quantitative estimates of impacts on global economic conditions. And that says it all. Now, but nonetheless, he just simply buried the results of the two of the 18, uh, two of the three scientists among his 19, with the average of people like Larry Summers. And therefore, his, his data point, which was that used to fit, the, fit his models and the models of all the others, three degree in temperature increase, 3.6% fall in GDP. Okay. Now, he did note at least that there was this divergence. There's a clear difference in outlook. Um, one was concerned that what we have to the approaching millennium, now this is of course written in the, 19, the late 19, early mid 1990s, so it's a, it's, I, I think we, we can see the dark ages coming now. Uh, he said another said the degree of adaptability of human economies is so high that for most scenarios the impact of global warming would be essentially zero. And that's the mindset these neoclassicals approach climate change with nothing to disturb the capitalist system. Okay? Now, would you imagine that with that huge divergence, if you're actually a genuine scientist, a genuine researcher, you want to go and work out why it happened? Well, he did a literature survey, and this is the literature survey he ran. The query was damage or impact and climate and cost. Now, he admitted in the paper, which hasn't been, it's, it's actually a working paper, it hasn't been published in the literature. Maybe that's one small blessing. Um, but it, it should be in there to be criticised. Um, and they ran it in three locations. Google, <laughs> well, 64 million results. Okay, Google Scholar, 2.8 million results. Okay, EconLit, 1,700. Ah, that's okay. We can read 1,700 papers or 1,700 abstracts. Let's ignore the rest 
and just look at what's written in EconLit. That's asking economists what economists think is going to happen to the climate, when most of the economists you're asking are people at Nordhaus's referee. It was a trawling episode to find a few more papers with these same ludicrous estimates. Now, what about the Web of Science? Why don't you look at the Web of Science database? Um, they actually, rather than asking why, why do climate scientists and economists differ, they said, let's survey economists and see what they think is going to happen and call that another data point. Um, now, when he, he reads, so this, by the way, if you do the web of science, this is what you find. They found 8,000 papers with the same query, limiting it to the, the last 30 years. 8,000 is not an impossible number of abstracts to read. Okay? A, decent lead, a decent researcher, and in no stretch of imagination is Nordhaus a decent researcher. Um, you could have read those papers, but he didn't. But when he does read the scientists, uh, having ignored them uh, when he didn't have to, when he does read them, he distorts the shit out of them. And this was just stunning to me uh, when I first discovered this because I was reading the manual for his DICE, uh, Dynamic uh, uh, Integrated Climate and Economics. So it's neither dynamic nor integrated, uh, nor does it really have anything about the climate because he makes the... So it's an equi it, I'd call it an equilibrium model. That's, 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 all, that's all. I take out the dick and you're left with equilibrium. And that's pretty much what you get in neoclassical thought in general. So it's, his damage function is simply a quadratic. It's 0 0.00227 times temperature squared. Okay, that's his damage function. I'm not joking. That's all it is. And it's he's reduced it over time. Now, he, he, he noted in, this, in the manual that the, the using a quadratic, of course, gives you a function which is smooth and doesn't have any sharp tipping points. He said, this is consistent with the survey by Lenton. Now, as soon as I saw that, my alarm bells went up. How on earth? I just can't imagine that there's a serious piece of climate, climate science research that finds that tipping points are irrelevant. That just doesn't make sense to me. So I went to look in his bibliography, to Lenton. It wasn't in his bibliography. So I searched on the web and I located the paper. Um, and then, um, because there's actually a particular, I've got a personal troll. What's his name? Jimmy Rose, because Jim Rose, I call him Jimmy just to annoy him, uh, based in Tasmania. He's always saying, why doesn't Keane read um, um, the, the climate casino, you know, the, the, you have Nordhaus talks lots and lots about tipping points in the climate casino. And in fact, there's chapter five uh, on that book, which I finally did read. Uh, and here is his, uh, in chapter five, here is Nordhaus's description of Lenton's research. There've been a few systematic surveys, a particularly interesting one by Lenton and colleagues, examine the importance of tipping elements and assess their timing. Okay? And he then says, their review finds no critical tipping point elements with a time horizon of less than 300 years until global temperatures have increased by at least three degrees Celsius. Okay? So he reckons the scientists have backed him up. Okay? Well, this is how he summarised. This is in the notes to the book. we have got to go take a look at the notes. Let's move this out of the way again. Okay. And since one person has turned the screen off, I'll just go down to you and me, Sam. <laughs> Hope the rest of the people are following along. So here's, notice the list, Arctic summer sea ice, Time scale 10 years, temperature range 0 0.5 to 2 degrees. So that numerically fits what he's talking about, okay? So why wasn't that part of what his concerns? It's, it's less than 3 degrees Celsius, okay? That's, that's 0 0.5, we're already past 0 0.5. We're in the middle of that, of that, that range that, the, that uh, he says, the scientists said, was what was happening. And he's telling the truth there. They, that's what they did say. Less than 300 years? Yes, 10 years. So two out of three boxes are ticked. Why does it not matter? Oh, because it's not critical. Thank God, we're saved. Okay, we can lose the Arctic summer sea ice. It won't have much effect. Don't worry about it. Just two problems. There's no such column in Lenten. Okay? And in fact, when you read Lenten, and this is what I so Nordhaus uh, would be failing, if, if I was getting stuff submitted by an, a sixth, seventh grader at school in a comprehension test, but Nordhaus was doing reading these papers, I'd fail the student and put them back a year. Okay? Because in this paper, Lenton describes Arctic summer sea ice as the greatest and clearest threat. Now that does not make it one star on a three star scale. So he made it up. That's why I'm quite happy to say Nordhaus made this stuff up. And I actually spoke to Lent and said, is there anything else you've done that could have any justification for the way that your paper's been interpreted by Nordhaus? And he said, no, your, my interpretation is correct, Keen. Um, the rest is garbage. This is, the, this is the actual table that was published that summarised the work. And again, I'll move this over here. 
Now, zooming in, um, maybe, being generous, maybe he misunderstood that word, okay? We're trying to work out why a student, uh, use, use the French term here, why a student fucks up in reading a paper and it gives you something which is total garbage compared to what they're supposed to tell you. Maybe he thought, oh, critical, uh, unidentified, no need to worry about it. Notice this little symbol here. That's explained down here. And what, that's, what that little thing says, theory, models, hang on, oh, there are a couple more people, okay, that I can see. Uh, theory, models and paleo data suggest the existence of a critical threshold, but we don't actually have a numerical value for it. But nonetheless, they're guessing it's in this range. Okay? Now, he says not critical, and therefore he ignores the scientist and actually claims justification for what he's claiming, uh, which is just simply based on just totally misinterpreting the data, not critical to the climate. It's just crazy, but that's the sort of stuff that he's done. So I, I, I haven't even started pulling apart his DICE model yet because his assumptions are so stupid. Now, Lent was unambiguous, and read him. This is the sort of thing he was saying. A critical threshold may exist, okay? Um, uh, but the, 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 in terms of whether that's for the entire, uh, let's say for the winter sea ice, then there might be one for the uh, some, for, for uh, let's say summer sea ice. The winter sea ice might still be there. We're not sure what level will eliminate uh, all the ice for all time on the Arctic, but we're pretty damn confident that there's a threshold at which there will be no sea ice during summer. And of course, we're getting closer and closer to that now. And then he said, given that the models significantly underestimate the observed rate of sea rate of decline, a summer ice threshold, if not already passed, may be very close and a transaction could well occur this century. And we're pretty, I think, with, I think we're going to be seeing that just, I'm, I'm, I'm no scientist in this front, of course, but with what we're down to now with under, under 4 million um, 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 square kilometres of ice, I think it is, uh, during the summer peak, we're not very far. It used to be 10 or 11, so it's, we're down to about 30% of the, of the usual uh, coverage during the Holocene. So we could see that go uh, for all intents and purposes totally uh, in the next decade or two. Now, he then says, Given our identification of, of policies, which pose the greatest threat to society, we conclude the greatest and clearest threat is to the Arctic with summer sea ice loss likely to occur long before and potentially contribute to Greenland ice sheet melt. And their conclusion just you know, knocks Nordhaus out of the park. It warns, literally the first sentence of the conclusion warns against using smooth functions and identifies the Arctic sea ice again. Now, how did this moron, and I don't, I use moron, in, I mean, I'm probably insulting genuine morons for using the word moron to describe a neoclassical economist, uh, but it, 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 neoclassical economics is a lobotomy for good sense. And this, I think you couldn't get a better example of it than Nordhaus's own work. Here's the conclusion by Lenton. Okay. A false sense of security by smooth projections of global climate change. And here is Nordhaus using Lenton to justify him using a smooth projection. Okay. And he said, our synthesis of present knowledge success of variety could reach their critical point this century. And then, bang, the greatest threats are the tipping of the Arctic sea ice. Okay. This is a fail. This is not a Nobel Prize. This is a fail in a student essay at high school. Okay. So how did it even get published? Forget about the Nobel Prize. How did this crap get published? Well, I think it's because neoclassicals, and thank God you guys are immune to this, go to see who you've been taught by and, and the... Uh, philosophical orientation. Neoclassicals mistake what uh, was called by Musgrave in a wonderful paper on, on Milton Friedman's methodology. They mistake domain assumptions for simplifying assumptions. Now, a, a domain assumption is something where if your assumption is wrong, so are your conclusions. But a simplifying assumption is if your assumption is wrong, it makes a small difference to the results. Now, a simplifying assumption, the classic instance of that is Galileo dropping two lead balls out of the Leaning Tower of Pisa and he ignored wind resistance. If he'd taken wind resistance into account, it may well be, I don't know the mathematics, I'm guessing the mathematics would have shown that the, the smaller, lighter ball would have traveled faster because its resistance would have been different. I'm guessing on that front. Uh, so by leaving out wind resistance, he's saying it's a, it's a simplifying assumption. Okay? If you actually evacuated the tower, which they couldn't do back in those years, of course, um, then it would have made very little difference to the results because wind resistance is so small. That is a simplifying assumption. But to assume that climate change is the same as the weather is not a simplifying assumption, okay? That's a domain assumption. It just doesn't, doesn't exist.
But the neoclassicals are so used to being told that you can't judge a theory by its assumptions that they would have approved these papers. So here's, if you haven't read, I do recommend going back and reading Friedman and then also reading Musgrave straight away afterwards because Musgrave does a brilliant job of pulling them apart. This is Friedman. Truly important that significant hypotheses will be found to have assumptions that are wildly inaccurate descriptions of reality. And in general, the more significant the theory, the more unrealistic the assumptions. And that's almost become a mantra for neoclassicals. And he then says you can't um, test the theory by its assumptions because they're never realistic. You simply have to see whether they're good, sufficient approximations for the purpose in hand. And that can only be seen by seeing how the theory works. Okay, so you put the theory out, you see what happens, and you test it. Oh, and if the theory is not right, well, then you throw the theory out for an empirical failure, not because of its assumptions. Now, this nonsense is routine in economics, as you've seen in debunking economics. Uh, there's, I'm sure there's so many times I've got to quote something which is outrageously stupid as part of their assumptions. Now, what happens if we follow Nordhaus's advice and wait to find out how Nordhaus's theory stacks up against reality? Well, if he's right, we get to 2150, and there's just been an 8.5% fall in GDP. Um, yeah, we, could, we were lucky. We should have ignored it. Thank God we took their advice. Okay? That's if the assumption is correct. If the assumption is false, Mark Linus gives a very nice overview of what we actually face with those temperature levels. Okay. And at six degrees, he said, a runaway warming process, and this is summarising scientific papers on what the, the past climate has been like when temperatures got to these one, two, three, four, five, and six degrees above pre-industrial levels. A runaway warming process that could render the biosphere completely extinct and forever destroy the capacity of the planet to support life. Now, that's a bit more than an 8.5% damage to GDP. Okay. So if that's wrong, well, goodbye, okay? So if you wait till 2150 to test this by its results and say, well, can we run the experiment again, please? Sorry, you're already dead, okay? You have to assess this theory on its assumptions and the assumptions are garbage, independent of the model with which it's been done. This is the last theory on the planet you'd ever want to test by not taking a look at the assumptions. But Again, as I've said, there have been quite a few neoclassical critics of, of Nordhaus. He hasn't got a free run entirely, and quite a few people were horrified that he was awarded the prize within the neoclassical community. But none of them seem to have looked at this stuff, and I'm still stunned that I'm the first person to publish something about it. So what we need, and this is where Linwood and I will have a bit of a chat at some point, we need system dynamics modelling of the interaction of the economy and the biosphere. We've got to put them both together. I mean, that's what the limits to growth did. And Nordhaus... Uh, was the main neoclassical economist who disparaged and ridiculed that work and misinterpreted as well, of course, um, and helped to undermine the credibility of that approach, which was is still in its infancy back then. So even though we had some system dynamics programs come out of it and I'll, I'll develop my own, the area's got nothing like the research funding it would have got if the limits to growth study was followed up and, and improved upon. And we need, to, that's, we need that as a, as a foundation. That's one reason I developed develop Minsky, but particularly for the monetary side of things. We need to be aware of the end role of energy uh, in, in both in human production and the ecology. And this is something that I, um, I had a little brainwave when I was in uh, a friend's house, Rob, Bob Ayer's house, as it happens, in, in Paris in 2016 or 17, I think, walking through his house, which was full of sculptures. And this, this is going back from the bathroom late at night and this little thought popped in my mind, labor that energy as a corpse, capital that energy as a sculpture. We include energy in there, um, then you, you have to include energy in production functions. We don't do it. As a matter of course, economists do not include the role of energy in production. So what I've did, and after having that insight, within 10 minutes I had the conclusion in terms of the Cobb-Douglas production function. You've got to incorporate it in there. Um, now, when you do, of course, all those so-called carefully environments need energy. So this is, the, this is taking two totally independent databases, one from the um, uh, Energy Authority on the, an estimate of the total energy used in the planet in terms of millions of tonnes of oil equivalent. That's the red line. And the blue is global GDP from a different database. Now, you can see they've got a reasonable correlation, 0.997. Okay. Now, that's partly because they're both increasing trends. Of course, you know, you'd be taught you'd use a stationary series. Well, let's look at the differences. Okay. Correlation, 0.83. Now, it goes both ways, of course. Frequently, uh, when there's an increase in GDP 
it will be because we're using more energy to produce more output, and you can see that in the data as well. Also, the financial crisis will cause a decline in GDP and therefore a decline in the amount of energy we're using. So it's a co-determination process. But that is an overwhelming correlation compared to the nonsense that Nordhaus and co worked on. Now, when you feed that in, and I think, I hope you know that Cobb-Douglas production function is, a, is another mythical um, piece of neoclassical work. Um, the Anwar Sheikh's paper that is simply brilliant. I, I have, I, I, he wrote a paper called The Humbug Production Function and showed that you can fit the word humbug to a Cobb-Douglas production function and get an extremely high correlation coefficient for it. A very, very clever paper. Uh, but even, even taking into account, uh, when you look at the Cobb-Douglas production function, it has output as being a, a product of total, what they call total factor productivity times labour times capital. Okay? That's the basic Cobb-Douglas production function. Uh, they, when they talk about energy, and this is done by Joe Stiglitz in the, in, in the aftermath of the limits to growth, I think, uh, he said, well, let's include energy. So K to the alpha, L to the beta, E to the one minus alpha minus beta. Now, the proper way, that is just saying you can, I mean, like if you have workers and machines inside a, a factory and then you hit it with a bolt of lightning or you throw a small nuclear weapon inside there, that will increase production. No, it won't. It'll destroy the bloody factory. Energy is channeled by machines and labour. Okay. That's the role of energy. We machines and labour are there to channel energy into useful work. So what you then do, and what I've done is say, this, strictly speaking, a simple way to talk about it is say rather than having K, you have, which is supposed to be the number of machines, and again you'd be aware of the impossibility of measuring the number of machines using their prices according to neoclassical theory because prices determine returns, so that's the circularity problem covered in the, the Cambridge controversies. Um, but if you, leaving that aside for the moment, if you replace K by the number of machines times the energy consumed by a machine over a year times the efficiency with which that energy is turned into useful work by the machine, then you get a much more realistic picture of what's going on. For the same thing for labour, I do a similar sort of thing, but I treat the energy input of a human as constant over time because you know, the Roman, probably a Roman slave could do uh, probably even better work, I imagine, than we would in terms of the amount of energy they can put in. There's been no change in, in this product, even though the amount of energy we consume has gone up dramatically. The amount we actually put into work has gone down, so I treat the product as a, as a constant. Now, you feed that into the Cobb-Douglas production function, and I'm omitting A, and I'll show you, you'll see why in a moment. What you get is this expression. So that's just making a substitution I've mentioned above. Rearrange it. And with the, here's your old Cobb-Douglas production function. What are the other two bits? Well, that's a constant. Okay, those are the factors taken out of the labour and capital. This is energy, the energy input through a machine and the number of machines, and they both have the same coefficient. They're both raised to the power alpha. Okay? Not raised as, as, as uh, when, when um, um, what's Stiglitz did this. Uh, alpha was about uh, point three. 0.333, and this is point, our beta was 0.6, this is 0.07, because that's the percentage of energy as a percentage of GDP. That's the way they chose their coefficients in their models. Well, I'm saying even if you accept that way of getting a coefficient, energy doesn't get a coefficient of 0.07, it gets a coefficient of 0.3. Okay? Now, when you feed that in and put that into a Cobb-Douglas production function, this is the difference you get. If with their model, with, with they're giving a coefficient of 0 0.07 for energy, they would tell you that if there's a 50% fall in energy input, there'll be a 5% fall in GDP. <coughs> Trivial. Okay? Feed it in with it simply correcting that particular issue by saying that energy is vital for production. If you get a 50% energy, you'll get a 20% fall in output. Now, in fact, the real world is you're going to be closer to 100% to, to fall. Rather than you're going to, certainly going to get 50 or more, so realism is what you need. And I'm working with Matthias Crisselli and Tim Garrett on de I'm developing this approach, bringing energy into production. Uh, and we're using a Leontief production function, which you would have used in a, a familiar way uh, with any post-Keynesian models you've looked at. Um, I've got V and in inverted commas there because I'm going to put the same argument in there uh, without V initially. And what I get is output in terms of widgets, which is the type of uh, single commodity model that almost all economists use, is, 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 comes down to K times EK. I've got EK in there twice. 
because to show that that's a conversion factor between the energy measure of GDP and the widget measure of GDP. And what you get is that what was your capital output ratio now becomes a measure of the efficiency with which your industrial system is turning energy into useful work. So that actually explains what the capital output ratio is, which I didn't expect. This is one of these things you find when you put these ideas together. So this is the inverse of what we call the capital output ratio from 1950 through to now. And you can see there's been a rising trend. Now, I've got a feeling it's going to turn around pretty severely in the, in the, in the, in the coming uh, decades because we will be forced to stop using coal. And, uh, and also the, what's called the energy return and energy invested is getting worse and worse for fossil fuels. <coughs> so the cost of energy, in that sense, are rising. So what should we do given all this? Well, one thing is we should strip um, Nordhaus of his Nobel. There's just one problem with that. You can't do it, OK? The terms of the original Nobel bequest, which the Swedish central bank has copied for the Nobel Prize in Economics, is that once it's awarded, it can't be taken away, even if what you find is the person who actually got it for work that's fraudulent. Now, Nordhaus did get it for work that's fraudulent. But I think we'll stuff that campaign for it anyway embarrass the shit out of the bastards. This should never have been given, this should never have been passed referees, let alone given a Nobel Prize. Now, anybody who hasn't been critical of Nordhaus should be kicked off the IPCC or any other body involved in working out what our response should be to climate change. And fortunately, one's already gone. Richard Toll resigned uh, after, I think actually, partly during the process of writing the last published report in 2014, because it was too alarmist. So this is Richard Toll in a Twitter war with me and a, and a few climate scientists late, last year. And he says, 10 Kelvin is less than the temperature difference between Alaska and Maryland, blah, blah, blah. Climate is not a primary drama of income. He's using comparisons of days distribution of energy, uh, of, of temperature and GDP to predict climate change. That is garbage. That's what they do. So I think they should not be, the, I'd be my preferred position, no neoclassical economist on the IPC or anything else. And I really regard neoclassical economists as the main uh, enemies, unintentionally so, of course, of capitalism. Because by convincing capitalists or justifying people like the Koch brothers uh, with their climate change nihilism and all the stuff you see about trivial damages comes out of Nordhaus's work, they're likely to bring capitalism to an end. Okay? Capitalism is not going to be how we get through climate change if we get through it all. So what they've done is they've mistaken weather for the climate. And if you really want to know what the difference is, I highly recommend reading Mark Lyonass's book. It's a superb integration of all the work of, of scientists around this theme of what, what was the paleontological climate like at one, two, three, four, five, and six degrees above pre-industrial levels, and what did that do to life forms that were on the planet at the time, and therefore what can we say is likely to happen to us? Now, one degree, I think, in that, I think two degrees, certainly, I uh, mean, Australia would become a complete desert, okay? And so, so would California. <clears throat> and we're already seeing that happen with the wildfires that are occurring right now. So we, this, this is the greatest scandal, the greatest hoax in economics, with, and the most dramatic damage to the prospects of human life, frankly, and life in general. Um, we have to get the, the politicians to know how bad this is. That'll only happen if it gets into the media. So I'd be very happy if you send this presentation to any journalist you know. And the most important thing is to get this paper uh, into the media. This is a paper I've published which covers all these details. It's in a journal called Globalizations, which I chose. The journal actually approached me and said, we're putting a special issue. Would you like to write up your, your blog posts? And, uh, and put some detail in here, which I did. <clears throat> and then it went through, of course, got through refereeing fairly easily. Referees actually reading what I had to say and not making stupid assumptions. Um, so it's got a lot of coverage on Twitter, but there hasn't been a newspaper article published on it yet, apart from the one that I wrote for the conversation. Um, and of course, I cover more of that detail. There's more again that I can cover. I left a, bit, a couple of bits out uh, about the uh, ludicrous work they did on um, on, um, on, on the, the temperature, fitting today's temperature to today's GDP and making predictions about climate change from that. But that's the list. So let's have a chat. Awesome. Thank you so much. Welcome. Um, I think uh, I'm hoping that there's a small enough number of us that if you have a question, you can just um, unmute and start asking. If we have a problem, I guess we can do something else, but let's try that for now. So if you have a question, just go ahead and ask. 
Uh, Professor Keene, uh, thank you for that. Uh, thank you for the talk. Fascinating stuff. Um, uh, my question is in looking at uh, these models, these predictions, these forecasts, et cetera, what are your thoughts on uh, global population and its role? I seem to be reading a lot more this year on theories around peak population, you know, in the next two to three decades. Um, oh, yeah. You know, partly drawn off of the rise of the middle class in China, but you know, as, <clears throat> as education increases, birth rates decrease, so potentially peak global population. And how much, you know, has that been accounted for in these models? Well, not at all. I mean, for Nordhaus, the Nordhaus, the population is going to continue rising and peak at I think 10, point, 10 and a quarter billion uh, by by 2150. But just using a just using a logistic function to get up to a peak level of population. Um, <clears throat> and disparaging any, any warnings about population itself, of course. Um, when you look at what the, in, in terms of the extent to which our, our food production relies upon oil, uh, because we grow, we basically grow our plants in oil, okay, superphosphate, all the, all the artificial fertilizers we grow, uh, which came out of the work of a, a, another rather dubious Nobel Prize winner, not because he was, didn't deserve it for the chemistry research, but because he was the guy who designed the, um, uh, gas for the extermination, plant, uh, uh, the, the gas for the mustard gas attacks in the First World War. And he thought he was going to get uh, prosecuted for war crimes rather than win the Nobel Prize for chemistry, but they gave him the Nobel Prize for chemistry and he, he didn't get to go to, to prison for uh, um, poisoning uh, allied, allied uh, troops. But um, he invented the process that let us convert oil into fertiliser. Now, if it hadn't, hadn't happened, I've seen estimates the population of the planet would never have got past two billion. So in one sense, exploiting fossil resources is one reason why we're at the level of eight, seven and a half, eight billion people now. When you look at what people like Stefan, uh, Will Stefan, who's one of the climate scientists trying most to warn about this, is an American, but now he now lives in Canberra in Australia as a retired professor. Uh, Stefan uh, wrote a, gave a talk in 2018 where he said that it was at a four degree increase in temperature, I think it was, uh, he estimates the maximum carrying capacity of the planet would be about a billion humans. And they would be, if they lived anywhere, they'd be in the Arctic regions and on, uh, probably on, on Antarctica once it starts to melt. Um, but the rest of us, most of the other, the, really one third of the planet would be uninhabitable, not just for humans, but for any, any, any animals that rely upon uh, temperature dissipation to stay alive, which of course is all animals. Cold-blooded might survive, I imagine. Uh, but mammals, forget it, okay? That, so you basically wipe out the equatorial regions because it would be too hot for animals to live there. Um, so this is all ignored. And what it means is that if we've pushed ourselves into a situation where we move towards the world in which the carrying capacity is, if we're lucky, a billion people, there's going to be an awful lot of deaths this century caused by ignoring the warnings of the limits to growth. I have a question, um, and maybe this is an unanswerable question in some ways, uh, but um, it seems like a conversation about uh, GDP percentages is illogical in these terms. Yeah. It's like GDP yep. could grow while we face this problem because GDP is just a measure of, you know, final productive goods in a year. So who knows what we'll do to deal with uh, the catastrophic circumstances, you know, GDP hmm. grows in, GDP grows in war. We don't want that. Um, so I guess in, uh, then the question kind of is like, um, as economists, what do you see our role being in this debate is, uh, and maybe your role also, is it, is it, um, <clears throat> like, do you feel like you have a, a positive framing that uh, of like how an economist should address themselves to climate chaos or, yeah, or is I mean, it I mean, mostly I mean, feel like a like we, we need to stop this other framing and then. Yeah. I mean, that, that's, a, that's very important. We've got to stop this framing of temperature and GDP. I mean, you know the old story about don't fight with a the pig. Uh, they, if they, they'll, they, they enjoy, they'll get you into the gutter and enjoy the mud. Okay. Well, in that sense, what neoclassicals have done here is drag us down to their level and got us talking about temperature and GDP, leaving out the middle. 
I, I imagine there's a fair few fans of the, um, um, what's it called, not The Simpsons, the other uh, crazy cartoon. Uh, I can't think of its bloody name now. Um, but you, 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 you know, well, oh, damn, it pisses me off when I forget these things. Uh, but there's the cartoon, American cartoon. Um, oh, South, Park. South, South Park. South Park, South <clears throat> Park. Where the, the, where the, is it, I've forgotten who, who goes and steals the underpants. It's, it's, and it, it's, it's, it's steal underpants, question mark, profit. It's the underpants gnomes. Yeah, the gnome, the gnome stealing the underpants. Okay, so there's steal underpants, question mark, profit. They've got us to this level. Forget about the question mark. We've got to get the question mark back in there again. And the question mark is, what is the link between the physical planet and production? They've left it out completely. Okay? They simply go from temperature to GDP. There is no physical production in the middle, apart from a Cobb-Douglas production function, which is invalid because it leaves that energy. <clears throat> and they also, uh, when you look at Nothouse's paper, and this is again, I think, common to most of these ludicrous so-called integrated assessment models that neoclassical economists have produced. Uh, there's no damages to capital. Okay? All that gets damaged is the goods coming out, the factory floor get reduced a bit in value, but the factory remains. They don't burn down. You know, like, there's no such thing as an Amazon uh, distribution warehouse burning down because of climate change, okay? which is that's why I showed that particular image. So we've got to go back to the physical, and this is where the work of limits to growth uh, should have been built upon. That was 50 years ago. Imagine what would have happened to the level of sophistication of that analysis if there'd been the sort of resources that neoclassicals have thrown a bill building Ramsey growth models and RBC models and all that garbage, if it had instead been thrown it in improving the sophistication of system dynamics and the accuracy of the models. Okay? And on that front, uh, there's been work done by a, a colleague of mine in Australia, Graham Turner, who was a scientist working for a, what was Australia's premier research unit. It's been destroyed by neoliberals since then. Uh, but he, using a very detailed database, uh, using a Canadian piece of software called What If, I might add, uh, which lets you uh, track uh, output over time and say, like, so many nails were used to produce so many other things, and the nails used so much iron, and then the iron itself used the nails. So it's an input-output system. Uh, but it's set up in such a way that you can uh, backtrack it and get it to be accurate to reproduce all the previous year's data and then you run it forward and see what happens. So using that database uh, and data up to 2010, Graham found that generally speaking we are running on the, on the standard run of the limits to growth, which implied a turnaround between 20, 2020 and 2050 and they deliberately did not make the time dimension obvious. They started had 1900 and 2100 at either end and no intermediate marks on the on the axis and the graphs and the limits to growth. The reason being, and they said so in text, we are not making a precise prediction for timing. Okay? We've used data from 1900 to 1970 to calibrate the model. We're then running it forward to 2100 to see what happens uh, under various different scenarios, but we're not saying this is an accurate prediction. Nonetheless, when you look at where they said there'd be a peak to GDP, or what they called you know, human welfare, I think, in the, in the model, it was 2020. So we need to do that sort of work, and that's what I'm doing with the. I'm saying 2019, 2019 was the peak <clears throat> of human welfare in the United States. Yeah, <laughs> call yeah, it 2020, 2020, it's been kicked in the balls or grabbed by the pussy, whichever one you refer. Oh, that, that, that's a, a simple That's a sympathy question. note for Donald Trump. Sorry. Yeah. No, we're, yeah, we all know. Uh, I just wanted to clarify, because you're talking about the stupidity of this sort of um, work. Did you say that mining underground, as long as it is not on a coast, was considered unaffected? Yep. But okay, that's yep. all. That's yep. my whole question. I know, I know. This is ludicrous. Hmm. Any more questions? Looks pretty quiet out there. Steve, could you I'll get it uh, yes, yes, start? Go ahead. Yep. Yeah. Um, uh, in uh, 2018, when 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 Nordhaus won his Nobel Prize, I sent an email uh, to the National Economics Association listserv. Um, the uh, the the part of the uh, the awarding was was um, the 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 language in in the wording was that uh, Nordhaus had created the first quantitative uh, economics climate model. 
And I, I, I alerted I alerted my colleagues that that uh, uh, J. Wright Forrester had done that um, almost about 20 years earlier. Mm. And, um, you know, uh, we talked about the limits, the limits to growth, uh, the, the update on the limits to growth and how the limit, the limits to growth model was significantly uh, more accurate. Absolutely. Uh, it, it, yeah, it, right. And, and so, and so, you know, um, I, I just sent a copy of that, of that email stream to Sam because it contains uh, Nordhaus's critique of the limits to growth and Forrester's response mm. to that critique. And, and one of the things that, 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 you know, I mean, Nordhaus's model, I mean, excuse me, Forrester's model contains 11 differential equations, all mm. interlinked. And uh, one, of the, one of the issues that, that you certainly uh, work on is the, 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 the lack of an ability uh, to, to work on um, dy um, dynamic models of more than two differential, differential equations if you're looking at analytical solutions. And so simulation becomes the way that you have to deal with these problems. Yep. And, and, and uh, the need uh, to, for heterodox economists to actually learn more economics, uh, excuse me, more mathematics. More mathematics, mathematics. absolutely. Can you speak yeah. on that for a minute? Absolutely, mate. I mean, this is one of the reasons. When I, I, you know, you, you might not know that I, I was I led a student revolt in e over e teaching of economics in 1973 in Australia, mm -hmm. the, the world's first. It was the only revolt we regarded as successful because we actually um, got the support of the rest of the faculty to have an inquiry into the economics department, got a recommendation for splitting the department and formed a department of political economy. Uh, the trouble was that the, the staff in that department and most of the students who went there again saw mathematics as the problem. And I was saying, no, they, they don't do mathematics. The term I've come up with to describe what neoclassicals do since then is mathematics. Okay? They abuse mathematics. When they use mathematics and get results they don't like, they make a stupid assumption to get over it and call it a simplifying assumption. That's the basis of the uh, efficient markets hypothesis, for example. Sharp built a very nice little model, if you accept all the neoclassical ideas, of how a single investor might decide to allocate his or her funds between a safe uh, a, 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 a asset with zero volatility and assets with, with positive uh, with large positive volatility, and then how did he get to aggregate it? He simply assumed we're all the same. Okay, we all have exactly the same expectations of the future, and if you then read in two thousand and four, you read. Um, um, <clears throat> Um, Fama looking back on the model saying not only did he do that, he seemed that our, our expectations about the future were correct. So the efficient markets hypothesis is built on the assumption that we're all the same, we're all, and we can all see the future and we're all correct about it. And that's the basis of the efficient markets hypothesis. Now, that's not mathematics, that's bullshit. Okay? Uh, the, the difficult thing should have been saying, well, I've got a model of a single individual. What happens when I take in more than one with differing expectations? And when he did write about that, he said, quote, unquote, this is from, a, I think, a 1977 paper of his or a book. The theory is in a shambles. That's the effect of dropping that assumption. Not that it's a simplifying assumption. You get much the same result. Don't worry about it. The theory is in a shambles. That's from Sharp himself. So whenever you look at how they do mathematics, they fuck it up. And like I just actually just recently I've been writing a paper on um, the, the Hicks um, Samuelson the multiplier accelerator model. Have you guys done that at all in your classes? The uh, second order difference equation. We do it in my development class. Okay. Okay. Well, you know, you, how many any, any of these attend? Um, uh, <laughs> it's 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 a it's a not a not a uh, required course so. Okay, well, you, 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 maybe you see, so I expected some sort of recognition there from others. But anyway, uh, that is based on not only a mathematical error, but a, a logical one. Because when you take a look at it, um, the equation that Hicks derived came out from adding desired investment to actual savings and called that why. There's no theory of economics that adds desired investment to actual savings to get um, G GDP. Okay? So when you correct it, you get a third order difference equation. But anyway, looking at it, I uh, was saying it still played a major role in pedagogy, this particular model, even though it's mathematically invalid uh, or logically invalid. And I went searching and I found, I think it's Sargent, it's, yeah, it's Sar Tom Sargent has a, a set of books 
uh, in a set of free courses they teach neoclassicals and it, 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 the advanced macroeconomics, two volume set. The entire discussion of differential equations in that book, those two books, was in explaining the dynamics of the second order uh, model, that's it. Everything else was a set of difference equations. Now, no other discipline worth talking about would use its advanced mathematics with difference equations unless you were describing something like uh, the life cycle of the Christmas, Christmas Island crab, who all give birth on a, on a particular full moon to overwhelm the predators, and therefore it's valid to relate one year's population to the next year's population. Otherwise, you use differential equations. So economics mathematically is ignorant. Mathematics is not the enemy. Mathematics is the victim. Okay? In that sense, mathematics is the abused wife of neoclassical economists and we should take it over and stop giving any credence to them whatsoever, pull them apart, show how wrong they are, and then build our own, and that's with the foundation of system dynamics. And uh, as Linwood knows, have you had a look at Minsky, Linwood, my software package? Yes, I, uh, yes, I have. I, I've looked how long at it. I see, I, I see, well, let me see. I, I downloaded a version about three months ago. Oh, that's pretty close. The, the yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah. The the version I'm mo most familiar with is is some of the early versions, which I know you yeah. were working on and so forth. Yeah, we've right. got a lot. I'll just sh quickly show you. Um, uh, Minsk, let's go share my screen again. Um, so I'm just doing my own recording here. Hang on a sec. Just uh... okay. Ah, hang on a second. Oh boy, I don't want to shut it down. No, not gonna. Oh hell! Oh no! Damn! I clicked on the wrong damn button. I felt. I'll need your sound recording, Sam, if you can send it to me. Um, I've just managed to stuff up my own recording there. Uh, but here is Minsky modeling modern monetary theory. And so uh, Stephanie and, uh, and Scott are talking about arranging a session where I can explain how to build a model like this. But this is um, Minsky building a model of, hang on, what's going on here? I'm not getting, oh, there we go. Good, bit of slow time response there. I'm so annoyed I just trashed that bloody recording. Um, okay, let's see. So what Minsky lets you do, which you can't do with other programs, is um, use double entry bookkeeping to generate differential equations. So each of these here are system state, loans, reserve, bonds, um, bank accounts, bank equity and so on. And lend here is matched with lend over here using the fundamental law of accounting that assets minus liabilities minus equity equals zero. So that's, that's applied for all the models here. So this is a system of, because you're seeing there's seven differential equations, and you don't even know you're designing differential equations when you put, you see that these, these are the flows, these are the stocks. What Minsky then does in the background is convert that into a system of differential equations. Okay? And um, you know, that this, this is just showing you the list of equations built here. You know that those equations are mathematically balanced because Minsky's already done the work to make sure that assets minus liabilities minus equity equals zero for every operation there. And then with this I can simulate, uh, in this case I've got a government running a 2.5% of GDP surplus, sorry deficit, pardon me, and what I show is rising GDP um, and um, a um, increasing equity for the non-bank financial sector, which if you then have some idiot coming along and saying you've got to reduce the deficit, you cause GDP to collapse by running a surplus. So this is the way of putting a numerical um, um, perspective on the work of modern monetary theory. And you know, it's, we, we are so ignorant on mathematics in economics. And the major development we can make is to do mathematics properly and use tools. And this is, you know, Minsky is applying the wisdom of, um, of uh, limits to growth, because it was Jay Forrester who first developed this idea back in the uh, back in the 1950s. But it's applying that in the case of economic output. And this is a model I put together, um, derived from first principles, of, uh, in, including the role of energy in production, and then just simulating what happens if you actually have a resource constraint, and uh, you then get this sort of collapse occurring in the model. It's extremely simplistic, not fitted to data yet. But this is the sort of qualitative change, quantitative modelling we should be doing. And we need more economics. We need more mathematics and economics, not less. But don't learn it from a bloody neoclassical economist. Go and learn it from a genuine mathematician or somebody in system dynamics. Hmm. 
Ah, William. Hi, mate. Good to see you. Have you been lurking? <laughs> okay. So, Sam, we got any more questions or you guys want to go and have a drink on a Friday night? Don't worry. We're already having drinks. Oh, good. Glad to hear it. <laughs> That's the benefit of the so, online club. Socially distancing. On, yeah, of course. Yeah, yeah. I, over here, we, I went out to an Argentinian steakhouse last night. <clears throat> That's what you can do when you had a country that has successfully suppressed the virus. Love it, Anne. Mm -hmm. So, go Thailand. Take a look. At, I highly recommend take a look at Thailand's data. Uh, it seems to be ignored. In the, in the media, but it's a successfully used public health measures and isolation and social distancing <clears throat> to eliminate the virus. So life's normal over here again, thank God. Are, are they letting Americans in? No way. Okay. <laughs> okay no way. Uh, if you want to come to the country, you've got to be a national at the moment, a returning national. They're, 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 tourism was 20% of the economy, so they've lost that right now. They're trying to promote domestic uh, tourism. They're also trying to establish uh, uh, free travel zones between countries that have eliminated the virus. And one of those is China, of course. So I am to imagine at some stage they'll let Chinese tourists come back, and that's about half their tourism business. And the, the, well, I know that China will be very happy to come back to Thailand. It's one of the favorite main party. So there are some people, uh, and you look at the number of tourists who come to Thailand, some of them from China, and it come three times a year. So if they, may, if they can open up China tourism, then they overcome that particular problem, and they're doing extremely well. Any other questions from people? Just uh, open your mic and start talking if you got one. A lot to process. Sorry? Totally. Mm -hmm. And I I'll just get in a comment, something uh, that you guys were saying, uh, you and Eli were talking about framing that resonated with me because I'm thinking that so often the comparison is being made between like the Green New Deal and the response that um, the US and other countries had to mobilize for World War II, that uh, metaphor is in the air. And you know, we're talking about GDP and estimating GDP, the effect of climate change on GDP. I don't think we really, I don't think uh, to decide whether or not to fight World War II, we had to do any GDP studies to figure out, oh, if the Nazis beat us in the war, what's gonna happen to, you know, that we didn't do that. That wasn't necessary to to decide that this was a thing we needed to do. So I'm definitely exactly. not saying that that those studies aren't worth doing for a variety of reasons, but certainly not to help us decide to save the planet or not. Exactly, or save the biosphere so we can survive on the planet. Hmm. So uh, if okay. there aren't any other questions, Christian, I don't um, have a question. This is Katie, but I don't have a question. But I just wanted to say hi, Steve Keen. <laughs> <laughs> Hi, Katie. <laughs> I have, um, you were one of the very first, e so I, I started off as an econ major as an undergraduate, and, mm -hmm. but the minute that I realized some of the assumptions they were making, I switched mm. to philosophy. Good choice, um, yeah. And then when, when we had the crash, I was like, I don't want theory, because I was so like, economists are insane. Mm. Um, so I was like, I don't want theory. I've already, you know, I had already decided that that was crazy. So mm. I was like, well, I just want to know how banks work. Just the, the, you know, the nuts and bolts. That was what was in my head. Yeah. So I, I looked at people who I, I, on my computer, you know, trying to figure out what words to use. And, and so what I ended up doing was try, looking at people who had um, written stuff about the coming collapse before it happened. Mm -hmm. yep. And I came, came across two articles actually, and, and I can only find one of them um, at this point uh, that actually names some of the economists. And mm -hmm. one identified, I think it was 12. The other one identified, I think it was 19. Um, mm -hmm. Anyway, and you were on those lists. Yep. And so you were one of the very first economists I, I read when I, you know, read some economists again. <laughs> and, and, so, 
and yeah and so this is so exciting to like even be like whatever this on zoom with you <laughs> <laughs> well thank you for that thank you yeah yeah i so, um um, yeah, it, 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 there's, so, there's so much garbage in neoclassical economics. It's taken up my entire life to pull them apart, and I still haven't finished. Oh, my gosh. Mm. And I have to say, Neil Wilson. Do you remember Neil Wilson? Actually, I don't. I know I'm a musician called Neil Wilson. You better, you better help me out there. Okay, so he was one of the people way back, you know, this was, what, back in 2009-ish, that <clears throat> was like, oh... He, he was really into MMT. He's in Britain somewhere. And okay. he's the one who started to say, well, how can MMT <coughs> and you hook up, basically? Hmm. Yeah. He's a systems person. He, he does okay. something. Okay, okay. System dynamics, okay, yeah. Yeah, yeah. Um, but he, but, uh, so he was, the, he was one of the people actually that really helped me. I, I, he always was able to put things in really simple terms to help me understand both you and MMT, actually. Mm -hmm. All right. Yeah, well, it, it's, I mean, I, 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 I can't place the names, which is a bit embarrassing. I probably have met him, but I can't place the name. But yeah, the, the handful of people who saw it coming. By the way, you, you know that I focus mainly on credit and my analysis so far, rather than government spending. And what I want to see is bring these two together now, because uh, MMT has explained the government's role in money creation and what I've explained is the credit system's role in money creation and demand creation as well. And it's perfectly, they're 100% compatible. We just have to bring them together. And that's one reason that Minsky has been built. I'll just show you that um, table I had beforehand. If I go back and share my screen again, let's see. Okay. That table I was showing you beforehand is effectively blends MMT and my work on... Um, on uh, uh, private money creation, because you have lending and repayment. Uh, and this is net lending, so you've got an increase in the money supply. Okay? And you've got taxing and spending, and this is the net increase in the money supply. And, and of course, when you, when you spend, you're creating demand instantly when you do it. Exactly the same thing applies to lending and government money, because the difference being that government money doesn't come with a debt for the recipient, whereas uh, private money does. But it's possible to bring it two together, and you can explain, for example, periods like the 1920s when you had Calvin Coolidge running a 1% of GDP surplus and the economy booming. Why? Because over the same period of time, uh, the private sector was increasing its debt by an average of about 8 to 10% of GDP every year. Okay. One overwhelmed the other. It looked like the surplus was causing the boom. In fact, the surplus was siphoning money out of the boom and encouraging even more speculation by doing it. And then we had the 1929 crash in the 1930s. So we can bring the two together, and that's what I really would, I'm really very, very you know, desirous of, of achieving that. I was trying to show you one more chart over here, by the way, but it looks like my, I've, I've overwhelmed my, um, my program um, by loading too much data. It, it's, an old, it's an old program uh, that, that doesn't handle large data loads, but I wanted to show you that uh, uh, credit, uh, credit change. I'll, I'll try to bring it up again in a moment and show that because this is what I was looking at uh, when I started warning about the crisis. My first warning was in December of 2005. The reason being I hadn't looked at um, private debt data for since writing my PhD thesis back in the 90s because I got caught up in writing debunking economics. So I took my eye off this particular ball. Uh, but I want to show you uh, once this data downloads uh, the relationship between change in private debt, which I, I, I use the word credit for change in private debt. People often use them interchangeably. When you look at how the accountants define debt and credit, debt is the dollars you owe and credit is the change in the dollars you owe per year. So one is a stock and the other is a flow. And again, that's a point where we really need to be very careful about that in economics. Uh, but I had data at the stage going back to 1952 for America. Um, and I've since established, a, built a, a composite data series going back to 1834 on the relationship between credit um, and, and debt and American economic performance. And once this comes down, uh, I think this, this, I'm still waiting for the data to load. Come on, don't fail on me this time. Uh, yeah, okay. That is the long-term history of private debt in America. 
and the, great, the, the, the red line down here is when change in debt, this is, the blue line is change in debt, the red line is zero. So whenever the blue is below the red, what you've got is a, a, a negative credit. And you have negative credit in the financial crisis, nothing at all in the post-war post period, the 1930s, and I didn't even know about this one until I reproduced the data. So what the hell happened in 1837? That's called the Panic of 1837, which was actually probably more severe than the Great Depression. I think it played a large part in creating the American cal uh, character, that particular crisis. Um, and that's not a good thing, by the way. So this is the perspective you can have on the role of credit in the economy. And what I want to do is bring those, bring those two together um, for future analysis, because um, to show the importance, again, the importance of um, this role of credit in the economy, that is the long-term correlation of unemployment to credit in America. Now, even since 1890, you get a correlation coefficient of minus 0.3. If you take into account the period from, 19, uh, from, from 1990 forward, this section here, you get a correlation of minus 0.84. So we have to include the role of credit in our thinking. Even you know, modern monetary theories argue we've got to think sensibly about the government. We need to think sensibly about credit as well. So thank you, Katie, for that. And uh, <laughs> yeah, all right. By the way, that's Steve. That's uh, largely what uh, Fadel and I view is what we're doing. All right. Okay. Taking Excellent. credit seriously, and right. uh, obviously defaults. Yeah, yeah. You've got more, and like mate, you're, you're probably the best way to uh, rob a bank is to own one. Uh, and, the, and the criminality. I mean, I'd love to see somebody use my Minfi software to have two sets of books to show that sort of criminal behaviour going on inside a bank, as well as the euphoric expectation to get caught up as well. Uh, by the way, have you read Richard Vague's A Brief History of Doom yet? Richard? Uh, Richard I'm Vague. Happy. Yeah, um, you, you and I, the, the, old, the old ears, mate, I know the feeling. That's why I'm wearing these things. Uh, Richard, a guy called Richard Vague, V-A-G-U-E. He's the least vague person I've ever met, I better say. A bit like the, the old, you know, the old um, Johnny Cash song, A Boy Named Sue. <laughs> toughest, toughest son of a bitch in, in the West. Well, uh, Richard, uh, is a, he won't tell me how much he's worth. He's in the billionaire level. He owned uh, two major American credit card companies. And then in, 2000, in 2001, I think it was, he started to get worried about the level of private debt. Uh, looking at mortgage debt, he thought, what are the possibilities of my customers being able to repay their credit card debt if they're in this much mortgage debt? Okay? And he, he'd go and talk to neoclassical economists, be told all the time, doesn't matter, you know, this is just a private transaction between two individuals, the sort of loanable funds garbage that, uh, that uh, Bernanke and, um, and Krugman came out with. And uh, he, he finally had, had the, the chief economist of Barclays Bank finally said, yes, their debt's been rising, uh, their liability's been rising, but so are their assets, and that's a trade I'll take any day, quote unquote. And Richard said, you've got a deal. He sold his credit card company to Barclays. And then when it crashed, of course, he had the money. Right? So he's then become, he's, he's both a philanthropist, he's, he's become a very close friend, so uh, uh, I'm biased. Um, but he's done a brilliant piece of work in this book. And he had, a, he's, he, as a billionaire can do, he's hired a team of researchers to go back and put data together. And he's actually given a better explanation for the Great Depression than I've ever seen. There was actually a real estate bubble that started the, uh, the 1920s. Okay, when you, if you read um, uh, J.K. Galbraith of the Great Crash, he doesn't talk of it. He actually gets the timing the wrong way around. He had the real estate uh, thing before and in, in Florida, uh, with, with by going through original data. Uh, literally better, not just the stuff you see in the statistical series, but reading newspapers from the time and so on, getting a team to go back and look at all this. He identified a real estate bubble as a cause of the 1920s bubble. Uh, and it's, it's, he has six major crises that he covers in the book, and it's brilliantly written. It, 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 to me, it is the uh, throw out Kindleberger, throw out um, uh, Mackay, the Mackay's fun to read. Uh, this is the new... Um, uh, manias, panics, and delusions. So I highly recommend getting that book. Very, very readable, A Brief History of Doom. Now that's You'll useful indeed. That's when in the United States, the phrase about selling you a swamp land in Florida first arose. Oh, right, yeah. Which is what they were doing, of course. Yeah. Yes, they knew very much yeah. what they were doing. 
By the way, <laughs> Akerlof and Romer in their 1993 looting article uh, argued not only that the fraud directly uh, misallocated assets and mm. hyperinflated bubbles, uh, but also that it sent false signals and mm. therefore it disrupted markets more generally and tended to create a self-fulfilling prophecy of yep. hyperinflating the bubble. I was there when they presented and uh, the reaction of the economist was, well, that's ridiculous. That would create a profit opportunity and people would simply arbitrage. <laughs> what a bunch of delusional turkeys they are, honestly. Yeah. I mean, it's just ludicrous that they get the respect of being the mathematical, empirical, hard-nosed people. That's why when I wrote my cartoon book, um, which um, it, it, it's called Econ Comics, it's on, you can get it on my Patreon site. Um, I, the, it was, the, by the way, not a I, single empirical comment in, uh, by the discussants, and the primary discussant was Mankiw. Oh, Jesus. Yeah, typical. Yeah. Yeah, but I talk about them being fantasists, okay? They're, they're, they're children living in a fantasy and they don't want us to prick their bubble. Well, we've, we've got to prick their bubble before they destroy humanity. And it's a, I'm, I'm afraid like an episode of Star Trek, I think we're on the wrong side of the Klingons here. <laughs> Any other questions before we call it a night here? I have a real quick question. Mm -hmm. You said that the, the crash of 18 something 37 1837 yeah um shaped the american character just could you just say a little bit i mean what, what do you have in mind i think uh stagecoach robberies <laughs> armed holdups and uh, and and the weapon the and, and the enshrining of weapons because you had if you look back at that data i'll bring it back up again uh just let me share screen again If you look at, I've got, I've got um, public debt here as well. I have to, oh, this, the, the controls don't work when this, that's why I managed to stuff up my recording because the um, Zoom got in the way of what I was trying to do on screen. Let's just go up and see if I've got that. Okay, that's, okay, this is private and public debt in the USA. And the series go right back to the um, 1700s uh, with the government debt. And what you have is a period where government debt was effectively zero. Okay, so they'd done the neoclassical fantasy of eliminating government debt. And you then had a fall in private sector debt, which means a fall in the money supply. So the collapsing money supply, um, it, 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 a huge depression, <coughs> and you got money any way you could. And I think that's a major part of where you get somebody like Donald Trump from or where you got the armed bandits of the later 18, 1800s from. I think this period here, uh, traumatised the American character. Uh, I'd, I'd like to read more about it. I didn't even know about it until I put this data together. But that period, zero government debt and declining private, means you have a massively deflationary system. And in that system, you give you any money that's around, you lay your hands on it. <coughs> and I'm afraid I said that's, that's the, the, the very negative part of the American char character. I, I was just curious. Yeah. Can, can I ask you one more thing? Is, is it possible yeah. to, to get that graph? I'd like that graph that you just showed. Yeah, sure. Look, I'll send it off to Sam. Um, this is all stuff I put up on my, on my blog all the time. Oh, by the way, there's one um, uh, Patreon is most of my posts. They were free, by the way. I'm, I'm, I'm the only ones that aren't free that the podcast. And that's partly because it's an enticement for some of my um, supporters, but it's also uh, the guy who does the podcast is, a, is a, a good friend and a great journalist, and he gets 10% of my Patreon revenue, so they're, they're restricted. But almost everything else is publicly available. The trouble is Patreon is like a continuous time feed. You can't go and find old stuff there. Uh, I mean, you're going to search through masses and masses of blog posts, so it's really a pain. I, I could say go and get it from my Patreon site, but I know you'd, you'd be pulling your hair out trying to find it. So a group of people who, are, again, supporters have given me a... Uh, a page in, I think, I've forgotten, I can't think of the damn name right now. It's too, too much alcohol last night and too early in the morning as well. Um, but there's a, a paper, there's a, there's a website they've given me which is designed to archive and, and curate information. And I'll be putting, I'm putting my stuff up on that particular page. So I'll, I'll make a comment about that in my um, um, 
Patreon feed, and I'll put it up in my Twitter feed as well, but that'll give you permanent access to all these slides and data. But Sam, just remind me and I'll pop that, uh, pop that data and chart over so people can see it. Steve, that chart supports what uh, I've always responded to crowding out, we should be so lucky. Exactly, yeah, it crowds in. And this is the whole, again, um, this is the whole importance of the modern monetary theory argument. And by the way, I've got to say, 99% I, I, of monetary monetary theory I had my head around, of course, but I, whenever I got asked about what does a government deficit create money, I hadn't analysed it, and I would hedge myself by saying to the extent to which the bonds are bought by the central bank. Well, of course, that's wrong, as Stephanie argues very nicely in the deficit myth. And when I put it together in Minsky, I proved that it was wrong, because, if you, again, if you tell, they'll show you that, that same table again. Let's go back and share screen once more. Uh, yeah, so if you look at uh, this table, um, the, the lending, if, if taxes, if spending exceeds, in this case I've got taxes exceeding spending, uh, I've, I've turned it from a deficit to a surplus in the, in the controls in the Minsky, but that means you're taking money, you're destroying money by running it. And then if you do it, you buy the bonds back to go in the opposite direction. I'll just turn off showing the numbers just for a moment here. But if you... If, if, if spending exceeds taxation, you create money, but you also create excess reserves, and then the excess reserves are used to buy the bonds. And that's a this is an asset swap. You're getting non in, you're, you're using non income earning reserves to buy income earning assets, bonds, and no bank in their right mind would turn that offer down. Okay, that's free money. So there's no problem in selling the bonds, and you could apply exactly the same analysis to World War II. How did America finance the 30% of GDP deficit in 1942? The 30% of GDP deficit created that money, which hired everybody who fought for the war effort, and the bonds they sold to the public took money out of circulation. When you include, and I've done this in a subsequent model, when you include, say, pension funds buying bonds off the banks to give pensions to um, uh, workers or whatever else, you get a negative here and a negative over here. Okay, so the, rather than the bonds paying for the war, they stopped the money that was going to the domestic non-military economy, causing the economy to overheat. So it, this, this is, the, again, the mathematics of Minsky can strongly support MMT. Steve, I don't know if you've seen it, but I actually wrote a paper that was on that exact thing. It was um, a working paper that has actually been accepted for um, publication, so that's exciting. But Good it's... It covers what the U.S. Treasury, it's a historical piece that goes through documents from the World War II period and puts mm -hmm. together how the U.S. Treasury was thinking about the economy and thinking about the problems they had to solve. And they make yeah. it very, very, very clear that they were not worried about getting money and they were always worried about inflation. It's exactly what wow. MMTers are saying today. Excellent. Okay. Because that's what we, we need. This is partly getting the, the idea of a Green New Deal. I mean, I don't know that we're going to save ourselves, frankly. But there's no problem in generating the money to save ourselves. The problem is the money going to the wrong things. So you'd sell the bonds to get money out so people can't go and buy, um, you know, airline, to, airline flights to nowhere uh, because they haven't got the money. But you're getting all the money you need to build nuclear power stations and solar power stations. Mm -hmm. Very much so. Mm. So any last questions? Okay, well, um, Steve, thank you so much for joining us. One of the downsides of the Weird Online Club is we can't really do rounds of applause, but thank you. <laughs> thank you. Um, okay. For everybody else, and Steve, if you, if you care to, um, I'll remind you guys that in the next two weeks, we've got some cool stuff coming up. We had Steve today. Next week on Wednesday at noon, we're going to have Larry talking about Supply Chains 101, so that should be pretty cool. Supply chains are a big deal this year. And then on Friday at 1 p.m., we're going to have Katharina Pistor, who is the author of the book Code of Capital. Um, she's a lawyer, and that book is about how legal maneuverings have created uh, massive uh, income and wealth redistribution towards the top and severely exacerbated inequality. So it's a good book and should be a good talk. So, and then uh, the following Wednesday, I believe we're going to have Robinson do a brown bag. And Robinson, what are you, what are you going to talk about on that? Yeah, turning your mic on, yeah. You're still muted. Oh, I, are you? Okay, he's, uh, he typed it. He typed. Okay. Um, the long-term impacts of lynchings. Of lynchings. Cool. Okay. <laughs> Fair enough. <laughs> okay. So we'll look forward to that too. So, mm. all right. Well, thanks everybody. And thank you, Steve. And uh, yeah.
Thanks. Have a great oh, well, thanks. Okay. Thanks, everyone. Okay. Can you, uh, Sam, just make sure you send me a recording as soon as you can, because I want to post this on my Patreon site, and I've managed to stuff up my own recording. So I'd be very pleased to get that. Will do. No Good problem. Good to see you all. Good to see some familiar faces Thank here you, as well. Thank you. Okay. Bye. Bye, Matt. Bye, guys. All right. Bye-bye.